It's good to sing God's praises together, isn't it? It's good to sing together. I sing in my car. Sometimes people, I'm sure, look inside my car and go, what is wrong with him? And uh, it's a good problem to have, singing in your car. And uh, there are those that go by that are playing other kinds of music that shake your car. That's, that's different. I'm not there yet, but someday. Well, here we are in the first Sunday of Advent, Christmas season, the strangest, strangest Thanksgiving some of us had. We had our immediate family with us because we been with each other through the whole thing here anyway. Um, but I know a lot of other families could not get together and did Zoom meetings. I talked to one of my aunts. She was able to Zoom her family. They're all over the country. And, uh, but I was thinking about the word signs, and then I happened to see on the news that the Friends of Baxter State Park for a fundraiser are selling older trail signs, and I thought, that's really cool. Uh, so I went online to see what they're bidding for, and I, I didn't bid. <laughs> they're, they're not that cool. They're really nice, but they, these are pricey little pieces of wood. Um, I have not climbed Katahdin now in a number of years. It's been a long time, but uh, in my younger days, uh, I think we'd made two or three attempts and, and went up from Roaring Brook, for those that are familiar with it, up to Chimney Pond. And then you had to check in with the ranger station at Chimney Pond, and there was fog. And I, it's amazing what times of year there's fog and ice up on top of the knife's edge. And they went, nope, you're not going up. And then finally, we had a nice late summer day, and me and Dick Sweet and Jeff Norton and Wayne Noss summited and then across knife's edge and back down to Roaring Brook. It was, it was a great day. Um, yeah, it was, that was fun. I don't think I could do knife edge. How many of you have crossed knife edge on Katahdin? Yeah, I don't think I'd do that again. I don't think my brain would let me. Um, yeah, I, th I, I, I could, but then somebody would have to pick up my fallen body somewhere. Anyway, I get too dizzy. So, so I was looking through the signs they're selling, and I think, oh, they're so cool. It would really be fun to have, but I'm not sure Lois even wants one of those in the house. So why would I bid that much money for one of those? Signs are interesting things. This is a sign I found, and this is my theme for our Advent season. If you're looking for a sign, this is it. And that's in our living room. I don't think it's going to stay there a long time, but I, I thought I'd put it there for now. If you're looking for a sign, this is it. Signs are pretty handy, right? How many of you were driving before GPS? <laughs> Most of us. Um, GPS is really handy at times. At other times, I've been in Boston. A few years ago, I was in Boston, really in the heart of Boston. And I was first at the light. And I had, I had taken a little different route than GPS suggested. Meanwhile, GPS is sitting there calculating, calculating, cal the light changes. You know what you do in Boston when the light changes? You go. You don't wait for GPS. So, but I've been around Boston enough, so I, I kept the GPS confused the whole time. It's chewing on every turn I made, but I got us out of there. But we like signs. And I was looking at signs when I was in Boston. I knew where I wanted to get to. You're looking for a sign. Signs can be really helpful, but you probably should pay attention to them. Years ago, we did a family trip out west, <clears throat> and we were coming down over, we'd gone over one of the real high mountain passes, and we're coming down the switchbacks on the other side, and we looked and we saw a tractor trailer rig on its side after one of the hairpin turns. And it's funny because all through that piece of road, there were lots of signs that basically said, here's your speed, and uh, somebody in that tractor trailer truck either didn't follow the signs or didn't know what his load was or it shifted or whatever, but he went, he went over and uh, went over driver's side. I don't think that's a good way to go, but anyway. Looking for signs. This is the verse that came to my mind as I was kind of chewing on this for a while. Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, that's Jesus saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. We wish to see a sign from you. So I did some research on signs um, because I, I thought, what was it they were looking for? What was it, I should say, that they hadn't seen yet? Not just what they were looking for, but what hadn't they seen yet? And what exactly are you and I looking for? What are we looking for? 
We're looking for answers. We're looking for happiness. We're looking for whatever. What are we looking for? What is a sign, biblically speaking? I found a definition that works, but it's a little cumbersome. It's a little wordy. We'll plow through it, though, anyway. A mark by which persons or things are distinguished and made known. That's a clunky way of saying something that shows you something. In Scripture, used generally of an address to the senses that attest the existence of supersensible and therefore divine power. In other words, something miraculous and out of the ordinary happens, and that catches your attention, and you go, wow, what's going on here? It's not the norm. It's something unusual. Looking for a sign. Looking for a sign. So I'm going to look at a couple signs this morning, and then hopefully carry this through for the next few weeks. Um, because I've been quite fascinated so far that I've gone in this study that God does speak to people in different ways. We think of those in the prophetic realm that get direct revelation from God. But all around us, as Paul says in Romans 1, there's the evidence of the Creator God. There is, there is plenty of evidence there that God is faithful. It's a new song I hope we'll learn for the new year. It's titled Evidence. Can't scratch through this thing. <laughs> Anyway, this is from Isaiah chapter 7. And during most Christmas seasons, this scripture probably comes up if you do some, if you subscribe to one of the many of these things online that give you Bible verses for the occasion. Um, Isaiah 7. So again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. And Ahaz, he was king, said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. But if the Lord says to ask for it, you should ask for it, by the way. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And I've stopped there. There's obviously more to that passage. But it is something unusual. And, of course, it wasn't fulfilled during Isaiah's time. And Once again, the, the, the telescope of prophecy, time's compressed. But it still had that reaching fulfillment, and that's where we're going to arrive at the next one, Mary's sign in Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. So is this an unusual supernatural event? Big time. Big time. How will this be? Uh, asked the angel. Mary asked the angel, Since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Those are very powerful words to have an angel speak to another human being. We've, some of us are quite familiar with these passages, and we lose the impact, the power that's in them. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. This is, the angel closes his little speech with this phrase, for no word from God will ever fail. The older translation is, will be void of power. God speaks, there is power. There is power. So she gets a sign. And then God, in his graciousness, gives one to Joseph. Again, this is an unusual chain of events. And this is in Matthew's account. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home to, as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now, you can't get much clearer than that about defining the who, 
the why and the purpose. How did she get pregnant? It's a miracle. What's the purpose? This is going to be the Son of God. Those words were said to Mary. To Jesus, the angel says to Joseph, his name's Jesus. He knows that in the old Hebrew form, form is Joshua, Savior, he who saves. He will save them from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So, Rick, we need that in a couple weeks, Emmanuel. Michael Card, um, those of you that are familiar with Michael Card, something he recorded many years ago, but it's a great, great song based on that verse, God is with us. That wasn't it for signs. Then we have the shepherds getting signs. Why is God doing all this? Again, they call these after the silent years. From Malachi to Jesus, we have 400 years, as far as we can tell, where God is not directly speaking to people in the, in the form of prophets. The silent years all of a sudden end with this cataclysmic, I call it, interruption of life as normal for a very few people. Very few people, and yet hugely significant. So I'm back to Luke's gospel. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. What's our word we use that means good news? Gospel. Good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a, oh, there's that word again, a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. As I looked at that, I thought, that's the sign, the baby in the manger? I'd say the angel, and it goes on, you know, the heavenly host. Great company of heavenly hosts appeared to the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. That's a pretty potent sign. You're getting all of this going on. So they all responded in faith. They believed. Isaiah's prophecy, he didn't know what it meant. He didn't see the answer to it. It was God was casting something into the future. But when it comes to Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, they get their signs, and they act in faith. Um, the nativity story, Lois and I have that on DVD. We usually watch it this time of year, every year, if you haven't seen that one. I think it's a pretty excellent rendition of what might have happened because it gives you a glimpse into the Jewish culture that they lived in at that time under Roman's thumb, Rome's thumb and um, you know what Mary felt like when she's discovered to be pregnant and Joseph's not the dad, What's, how's he dealing with it, and all that, and then they go and have the baby, the travel, the whole thing. It's, it's, I think it's, it's an interesting interpretation of those events. But whatever surrounded it, this group that we just looked at very quickly, they all responded in faith. They responded in faith. They didn't have to respond in faith. In a sense, nobody has to respond in faith. Even when you see stupendous things, you don't have to respond in faith. God gives you that free choice. But it kind of makes sense to, doesn't it? The signs inspired faith. Faith became, becomes full-blown belief. I, and I'm kind of splitting hairs on how I'm defining the words faith and belief, but I want, I want to try, I'm trying to spell out there's a progress here. There's a seed planted and something grows out of it. And, and as that grows, it produces fruit. <clears throat> And then, because that faith seed's growing, it turns into action. Mary's action, Joseph's behavior and his actions, the shepherd's actions, as simple as it sounds. They leave their sheep and go down into the village and find the baby in the cave and the mother. So their belief follows into action. There's something that happens there, and they respond to it. And it makes me think of what's going on in our world today. There's a lot of stuff going on in our world today, a lot of stuff. Obviously, here in our country, um, we're dealing with the election and, uh, and what's going to come with all of the things post-election. That happens every four years. Worldwide, it's the, the COVID pandemic that is growing in numbers globally, and then there is the hope that these new uh, immunizations are going to work 
and work properly for the most people. Nobody knows till it happens. So there's a lot of unknown things going on, and yet I think tied into many of these things, God is calling people to himself if they will respond, if they will see what's going on. I'm not saying that the election is a sign or that COVID is a sign, and yet, in a way, they are. They might, they're not the final destination, but they're assigned posts. And all the stuff that's going on, probably not as miraculous as the ones we just looked at, but what do you see God doing or hear or perceive him doing? Because God is doing things. Uh, we had something going on in our lives. Lois and I were talking yesterday, and I said, if God is sovereign then he knew the timing of these events that led up to this. And so therefore, some things that I couldn't figure out and, and were very confusing to me, he, because he's sovereign, then he already understood all that before it happened. But he wants to know what I'll do with it. So he's looking at my response. There's things going on probably in your life that don't make sense right now. You don't, you don't see the purpose in it. What is God doing? But if he really is sovereign and he really does love us, then we can stop and say, God, you are faithful. Help me to get this. I don't want to miss something that's key here. How will you respond to what's going on in your life, whatever God is saying to you? And more than that, maybe, how will you respond to someone else when things are going on in their lives? And here I want to just share a little story that I heard on the phone yesterday in the car. In this picture, I don't know how well you can see it, it's a picture of my Uncle Alden Street and his wife Betty. She's been in a nursing home for a couple of years now out in North Wyndham, and uh, basically this is their level of contact since COVID. They have a window. They put their hands to a window. And uh, I can't imagine, number one, that whole circumstance. And a few of you in this room know my Uncle Alden. He's, he's, uh, he, he gave me permission to share his story here. Um, he's a character, if I can say that, and I think he would agree with me. He's been a businessman. Um, he's been an over-the-road truck driver. He's been a school bus driver. He, um, he's far more type A than I am, if I can classify it that way. And he was next to my mom. My mom was the oldest and then Uncle Alden. And the joke was we didn't think they came from the same parents because they were so different. They had very different personalities. But my Uncle Alden, in his, he's always been a Christian, but he, his own wordings were, I, I, I didn't follow the Lord the way I should have until later in his life. And then it's like he really has been on fire for the Lord. He's going to turn 93 next month, but his mind's way better than mine. I know you'll say that doesn't take much, but it is. His mind is sharp as can be. He is limited in mobility, um, but he is not limited mentally and he's not limited spiritually. So recently, he had gone to visit family. He had a helper that would drive him, and they, they had a motel room. And in the morning, he got up early to the lobby, went down to get himself some coffee and pastry or something, and there weren't many, there wasn't anybody else in the lobby. And, and another gentleman came down that was obviously a businessman, nicely dressed, et cetera. He got a coffee, and uh, they're wearing their masks and all that stuff. And my Uncle Alan says, hey, why don't you come down and have your coffee with me? Come over. So they sit across the table from each other and start having coffee. And they're just chatting. Uncle Alden's getting to know him. He's getting to know my Uncle Alden. But Uncle Alden said, I could see in what he Hear in what he said and see in his face, he was laboring under something. And I don't know what it is, but he said, I decided I'd ask him. And I'd say, I, I, I asked him if, if he could come up and share it. He said, I, I can't now, but maybe I will sometime. Because Lois and I are listening as we're going down the road in my truck. And Lois just starts crying, and <clears throat> I'll have to work on it here. So anyway, the guy says, yeah, I am. I'm going through a tough time in my life. And, and Uncle Alden goes, did you know there's someone that can take that burden from you? <clears throat> and guy goes, no. Alden says, I explained to him the way of salvation through Jesus. And he said, with tears running down his face, the two of us sitting in that motel lobby, he gave his heart to Christ right there. <clears throat> yeah. And he said to my Uncle Alden, he said something to this effect, thank you for caring so much for me 
that you would share this with me. I needed to know this. And Uncle Alden said, well, I found the same love and forgiveness, so that's why I, you know, so it's my paraphrase. Uncle Alden, by the way, is a great storyteller, so if, if I can get him up here, it'll be way better. But the outcome was still the same. He was sensitive enough, my uncle was sensitive enough, as he talked to that man to go, this guy's dealing with something. And, you know, we don't even have to know what they're dealing with. That's not our, that's not our deal. But we do know where our help comes from. Sama said that in Psalm 121, is it? Where does my help come from? Not, you know, lift up my eyes to the mountains, but the help doesn't come from the mountains. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And that's what he presented to this, this businessman. Your help is in Christ. So as we listened in the car <clears throat> and cried in the car with him, he was emotional as, as he shared this story with us. And that's the first thing I said, Uncle Alden, you want to come up and share that? And he goes, well, I can't, but he says, you can share it. So he'll probably watch this. One of the, somebody will show him this on Facebook, and he'll say, Ronnie, you butchered that. But anyway, <laughs> and he will be right. <clears throat> but he knows that our hope is in Christ, and without Christ, people don't have hope. How could they? If you are counting on the government to help you, how can that give you hope? <laughs> If you're counting even on family and friends to bail you out every time, how can that give you hope? Because as best, as good as people are, people, we, as we all know, we fail from, times to, from time to time. It just happens. That's the way life is. But God will not fail us. Actually, God cannot fail us. So how will you respond to what's going on in your life? What is God saying to you? What is God saying to me? Will I respond in faith? That active thing that says, I really believe. I get a little bugged at Christmas season because there's a lot of I believes out there. Have you noticed that? They believe in elves. They believe in this and they believe in that. And uh, I think, no, you're robbing a really good word, belief, pistis faith. And you're stealing that word when... It, it, it only works when we put our faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. How will you respond in faith today? And just as importantly, I believe, will you be ready to help another person respond in faith? Will you be, will I be listening to what's going on? In a sense, that's the sign, what they're sharing, where they're, where they are, and their thereby moved by God's Spirit to offer them the greatest gift of all, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I love, at Christmas time, it reminds us of this powerful name, God with us. God is with me. God is with you. If you've put your faith in Jesus, God is with you in a, in a, in a, a greater dimension than most of the time we can comprehend. We t I, I, I'll say that for myself. I tend to almost minimize God, the power of God's Spirit who abides in us and try to figure things out on my own and do it on my own strength. When Jesus says in John 15, verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing of value. I mean, we can do stuff, but the real lasting value comes from our relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus still saves. And therefore, we should act like it. <laughs> he still saves. There are still people out there that don't know how much he can help them. I don't just mean with the gift of eternal life, as fantastic as that is, but just dealing with life's pressures, life's needs. To know Christ is the greatest knowledge of all. Amen? the greatest knowledge of all. So we're going to sing in closing. We're going to close a little early today. How do you like that? Um, Your grace finds me. I, I love this piece. We learned it a few years ago. Believe it or not, it's been uh, seven, almost seven years since we learned this song. Your grace finds me. It's all around. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you for finding me. Thank you for finding us. You, we were that lost sheep, and you didn't say, who cares about them? You did whatever it would take 
to bring us back, and you did it. Thank you, Jesus, for rescuing me and us. Thank you that my uncle could be listening enough to offer man that man hope he hadn't found anywhere else. Hope in Jesus. Lord, through this Christmas season, they say this is not only the darkest time of the year, you know, astronomically, but it's a very dark time for many people emotionally and spiritually. May we reflect your wonderful light. We then, reflecting your light, are the light of the world, and we can offer your grace to somebody else. Others will be rescued, will be found as we have. Amen, Jesus? We go encouraged by your grace, renewed by your grace, empowered by your spirit. It's not in the flesh, but by your spirit. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Well, we will go off the air shortly here, and then I have a couple things to announce and pray about. <laughs>